everyone. My name is Shan McGrail, and I'm the executive director of Holtec. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that a lot of people are joining us from, you know, various other ways they found out about it. So welcome to the Holtec clients and uh, community partners, uh, but also everybody else who uh, is joining us for the first time. We're pleased to have you here. If you're not familiar with Holtec, we're one of the Ontario Regional Innovation Centers, and our mission is to help start up and scale up technology companies really navigate all the different milestones on their way to uh, growth and profitability. Um, we're uh, based in Halton region, but we've been working with um, clients from all around the GTA and different areas and uh, supporting our other partner regional innovation centers. Um, and uh, if you're joining us from one of our partners, welcome. And we've been working together, especially since we've gone online, with uh, all of the other centers and making sure that our webinars and our expertise and our content is available to everybody online. So we've been partnering with Innovation Factory, Innovate Niagara, Innovation Guelph, WeTech Alliance. So if you're joining us from one of our partners, welcome. I would just like to now turn it over to Isabella. We've been doing these sessions now for uh, several weeks, I guess since about mid-March, and I uh, wanted Isabella to maybe just share with you what is coming up in the next couple of weeks. Sure, thank you, Shan. So my name is Isabella, and I am Programs and Operations Manager at Haltech. And uh, as Shan mentioned, we have been running our virtual office hours, because of course our physical office is closed, but we're trying to stay connected, especially with our clients, with our partners and sponsors and anyone who is interested in joining us. Every Monday, Wednesday and Fridays, we have sessions from one to three, um, where we're trying to have like a scheduled speaker to discuss, especially some areas around, top, um, around topics of COVID and um, crisis and how to come out of it and entrepreneurship, of course. And um, every Mondays, actually, from one to three, we discuss strategies to pivot your business in a crisis. So this is where we invite our mentors. And um, the sessions are meant to be kind of like a round table, brainstorming, we discuss um, opportunities, strategies, anything from pivoting, uh, design thinking, agility, so on and so forth. So I encourage you to join us every Monday. Then, um, few things to uh, mention is next Wednesday, we have invited uh, the Magnus Group of Insurance. They're our sponsors and they will be discussing managing risk and insurance during COVID-19 from insurance perspective. So they will be talking about their view of um, like insurance perspective of COVID. They'll be talking about business risk, customer relationship, and so forth. Um, Next week on Friday, we invited Haltech mentor, Brad Fitzsimmons, who will be talking about, about you and your company beyond COVID. So do you see COVID as opportunity or as a crisis? How do you have to prepare yourself? How do you take care of yourself? How do you tap into your resources? And how will you be, how, um, your, where your business will be and how it will be after this is over? And Sean, if you can, thank you. And then on Tuesday, May 12th, we have invited MNP, which is again our sponsors, and they will be talking about SHRED. So scientific research, experimental development, tax credits, tax incentives for businesses, for innovation. And, um, and this is really an uh, important session to attend, especially if you're planning on claiming, um, if you're planning to apply, if you're planning to apply, Join us on May 12th. This is again from 1 to 2 p.m. And lastly, we have um, just confirmed Brian Lenahan, who is our AI expert, and he will be talking about emerge like digital migration, especially in AI uh, field. And he has, I think he's just finishing his third book, so he's very, very uh, passionate about artificial intelligence, and he'll be just talking about Overall, all you need to know what's what's going to happen, what's what's coming, the virtual education, virtual lead generation, um, virtual real estate, anything and everything. So that's May 13 from 1 to 2. I will be sending you links after this presentation. Thank you, Shan.
Thank you, Isabella. Um, so hopefully you can join us from the, for some of those sessions. And I now want to give a call out to our sponsors. And I've mentioned this in our office hours, is that our sponsors have been with us to bring their expertise, their content to some of these sessions, as well as support anybody in the community who's looking for some help at this time. So they've been great to uh, bring forward what they know, their connections, their expertise, um, and we really appreciate them checking in with us and offering that kind of support and that help. As we have been doing in these office hours, uh, we also use this as an opportunity to share with you anything that we see coming out in terms of new programs or um, different opportunities for businesses. And just yet between yesterday and today, there's uh, two net new things I wanted to bring to your attention. One is that the Ontario government has just sent out a link and put up a site for identifying any regulations, policies, things of that nature that are getting in the way of doing business at this time. So if you go to that site, if for example, there's a, um, some kind of a policy or regulation or uh, some, something at an Ontario provincial level that is causing problems for your business or your association or your group, you can register it here and they're starting to look and review at the, review those submissions to see what they can change to make it easier for everybody to do business or to do what they need to do. Um, and there's some great examples of what they've already moved forward on. Things like deliveries for grocery stores happening at, happening at any hour rather than just between certain hours. So there's some great examples. So I encourage you to go take a look if you notice something getting in the way of your business. The other thing that um, you can also look into is if you are in the business of providing something that's going to be required post COVID, the Ontario government is looking for your ideas and your solutions. So it could be along the idea of anything that can read body temperature, thermal imaging cameras, test kits, other kinds of applications that may help with social distancing. You can go to the Ontario Together website. You can do a search on that, it'll come up, or we can share the link in the chat window. Um, so you can go there and register directly, or you can also contact us through adrian.not at haltech.ca. Adrian's our front line for client services. So if you think you've got an idea and you wanna get a little bit of support on how to craft it or um, articulate it as a way to help post COVID, we'll be here to help you with that. And with that, I would now um, love to turn things over to our speaker for the rest of uh, the session, Dusan Bayek. And I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dusan over a phone call, I think it was originally, and um, found out more about the topic that he's going to touch on today, which is really the onboarding clients and how important that is to do that with a way that makes them want to stay with you. And um, we were lucky enough to kind of have that conversation, but then um, volunteering from Dusan to share that expertise with you. And I'm thrilled to hear about it because it comes from, you know, gr some great theories, some great tools and background, but he's done it himself. So I'm sure he's got some war stories to share along the way. So the plan will be, I'll turn it over to Dusan. He's got slides to share. And then I think if we can um, do that, maybe go till about uh, 10 to or so pause, see if there are questions. And then by two o'clock, um, if you're here just for this session, great. We understand if you have things to get to, but after two o'clock, if you wanna stay on and brainstorm with us, or you have a topic that you wanna discuss, get some other input on, we'll use that time from two to three to do that. So with that, Dusan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, cool. Thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction, Shen. Um, <clears throat> let me just uh, share my screen, quick time. And uh, let me know if you guys see it. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, very quickly, if you have any questions, use the chat window and um, we can moderate this way. Yeah, uh, I won't be able to see it in, in this full screen. So um, Isabella, if you, if you can dictate or just, you know, voice them out on behalf of them, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much uh, for, for tuning in uh, to hear me speak about uh, customer onboarding. Um, 
I think, uh, I think customer onboarding doesn't necessarily get, get all the attention it deserves, um, mainly because I think growth is, is often associated with um, adding new customers, right? So you, uh, you go down on, the, on your feed in LinkedIn and you see, you know, very glamorous kind of statements about people, you know, growing their top line or, um, you know, uh, getting, you know, thousands of new subscribers to their platform. Which, which are all really great stats. But, you know, my common rebuttal uh, to that is um, how many actually stuck around? And that's really uh, a really important kind of lever to growth. Um, because I think, I think you, you need to have a solid onboarding process um, that correlates, you know, with, with healthy retention uh, before you even start to think about scaling. And, um, and the reason for that is because, you know, if you start pumping more money to a system um, where, you know, new people are added quickly, but they fall off, you're really scaling a broken, pro uh, a broken system and uh, you're wasting, you know, money and valuable res resources along the way. So, and I, I've kind of, I've seen this happen time and time again. Um, and so, you know, when I was talking with Isabella on, you know, the various different type of topics in growth marketing, uh, we kind of nailed down to this because, you know, we think it's, it's quite the timely discussion um, given what's going on today. Um, <clears throat> companies are, are slowing down their acquisition efforts. Um, they're slashing marketing budgets. You know, the coach just made an announcement that they're stopping all brand marketing altogether. So everyone's really narrowing down on um, engagement and preserving their customer base as much as possible. And so I think, I think, you know, onboarding is kind of a great start in doing that. And, uh, you know, for those that are listening, um, this webinar is an introduction to the basics of onboarding. And uh, so if you're looking for some more advanced insights, uh, drop us a note in, in the chat and we can definitely look to deliver that content in any kind of subsequent uh, sessions. So, uh, you know, before I get to the content, I thought maybe I'd give you a little bit of a spiel about who I am um, and why I have a little bit of an ounce of credibility to talk about this topic. Um, so I'm currently a customer growth and success consultant and uh, I predominantly work with B2B SaaS companies. Um, and I help them with not only acquisition uh, of, of new customers, um, but more importantly, I, I, tr I try to strive ways to help keep them. And so um, prior to this, I was, a, I was a partner in a startup called DealTap. It was, um, it was a SaaS company that, uh, that digitized the real estate paperwork process for agents when they were buying and selling homes. So I ran it about for, for about five years. Uh, we raised over 13 million, you know, our team grew to 35 individuals and uh, we had several thousand real estate agents on the platform. So we, uh, we ultimately got acquired uh, by US Player uh, last year. And so for me, it was kind of a great way to, to pivot um, and you know, coach other founders and sort of not make the same mistakes that I have uh, while scaling the business. So without further ado, I, I figured we, we start. Um, for those who can see, you know, I love plants and so I'm, I'm trying to use as much references to nature as I possibly can. Um, so every single time I talk to a SaaS company um, who are, you know, experiencing massive drop off uh, immediately after sign up or, you know, they have um, low free trial to paid conversion rates or, you know, they're only having a very few customers um, that are staying past 90 days. Uh, eight times out of 10, it's an onboarding issue. Okay. Uh, the other two instances, you know, relates to, you know, not having product market fit, you know, we can cover that for, for another time. So, you know, whether the time to first value is too long, um, the experience is painful or expectations are simply mismanaged. The seeds of churn, uh, can be traced back to onboarding. So, um, I figured, you know, I share some stats that kind of really paint the picture as to why you should care about onboarding. So, you know, first thing is, you know, you'll lose 75% of your new users within the first week, right? It's a, it's a pretty staggering, staggering uh, stat. I and mean, it kind of really speaks to um, the low uh, tolerance or, or attention span people have in, in the digital spaces uh, to learn new products and tools. Um, 40 to 60% of free trial users uh, will use your product once and uh, they'll never come back. Okay. And, you know, it's also very difficult and costly 
uh, to acquire customers, um, you know, you know, first, you know, spending the time and effort to like raise awareness about who you are, convincing them to sign up uh, only to see that investment, you know, wither away through a churn shortly after um, is, is kind of like a tough pill to swallow. <clears throat> so um, for all my funnel lovers out there, um, it's kind of important to understand, you know, where does onboarding fit in the entire customer journey? Okay. So, you know, you start off with kind of acquisition, which is at the top of the funnel. Um, and this is all about, you know, how customers find you and, and where you are sourcing your new signups. And so, you know, you know, after you close a sale um, or you convince someone to sign up, you know, the process of onboarding or activation um, really, really starts. And uh, this section is, is all about, you know, how quickly you can get your customers to the aha moment of your product, okay? And uh, you'll notice that right after, you know, activation, we're kind of in the retention stage. So this is where we kind of look at, you know, product engagement um, and we see, you know, what the usage is like and how many customers are sticking around. So, you know, <clears throat> the bottom line here is the more customers you can kind of get to experience the aha moment of your product, uh, the more likely you are going to retain them. So <clears throat> I like this definition of, um, of customer sex, uh, success, excuse me, uh, by, uh, by Lincoln Murphy. Uh, he's kind of like a thought leader in, uh, in this space. And he says, you know, customer success is when your customers achieve their desired outcome um, through the interactions with your company. And so, you know, it's kind of like a fancy way of just saying, you know, customer success is really all about solving the customer's business problem, right? And that flag at the top of the hill um, or the mountain um, kind of represents, you know, your ideal solution in, in, in way to, to achieve that. So there's kind of a common, you know, um, mantra that, that, that says, you know, you know, people don't buy software. Um, they just really buy better versions of themselves. And so, you know, if we think about, you um, um, like an example of like an advertising product, um, like Google AdWords, right? You know, the customer's business goal in using this product is, is not really to place ads. Um, it's not really to optimize spend or even really like uh, increase click-throughs. The goal is to acquire a customer, okay? Um, and your team's customer success team uh, should really help, help them reach that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, um, customer success is like, kind of like the engine um, in, in your company that's all about consistently delivering value um, as it pertains to that business problem, right? And so um, it's, you know, the more incremental value you can deliver, the more likely you'll, they will kind of stick around. Um, and it's really uh, a game, if you will, of, of momentum and you want to keep that going. So as of kind of like a function of customer success, you know, uh, onboarding is, is getting your customers to achieve a first taste uh, of their desired outcome using your product. That taste is the aha moment. Um, it's like the, uh, it's kind of like the, like the appetizer to like the main meal. Uh, it's like the first date, so to speak. Uh, it's really showing the potential of what your product and your company can do. And it's really, really important to kind of nail it. And so, you know, with our, with our little guy here running, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, reaching that kind of that first milestone and, you know, um, convincing him or her that, you know, this is the first step that you can now achieve the rest of your business results. So, so here's like, a, here's a type of onboarding, um, everyone's kind of familiar with. And, 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 and I'm going to talk about a little bit about different styles and types of onboarding that kind of exist. Uh, it's kind of, it's called the, the low touch method. All right. Um, so this is when the, the tool itself, you know, helps to onboard you. Um, it's, it's completely self-serve, right? Uh, it's automated. Um, it's, it's typically done with like a, a whole bunch of, you know, wizards or tutorials or, you know, little pop-ups within the app. Um, and, you know, you see this a lot with, you know, lower price products um, or free products even that have, you know, relatively simple functionality. 
Um, so, you know, it can include all of your kind of favorite consumer apps or productivity apps um, like, Net like Netflix, like Slack, um, like Duolingo, like Evernote and, and, and things of that nature. So on the other hand of that spectrum is the, the high touch method, okay? And uh, this, is when, this is when the company pairs the client with a dedicated account manager or an ex, uh, a customer success rep uh, to help kind of guide you throughout the, uh, the onboarding process. And um, it's, 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 it's considered to be like a concierge kind of white glove approach um, that's, that's tailored and, it, and it's really custom to, to your unique business goals. Um, and you see this a lot for, you know, um, more complicated products um, or enterprise grade kind of products like, you know, Salesforce or Tableau. Um, and it can also be for a lot of, you know, small and medium sized businesses as well. Um, and, and then lastly here, you know, you can have a hybrid model, which kind of bridges both of them and utilizes both of them at the same time. Um, you would see, for example, like a, like a low touch method um, for like end users who are kind of tech savvy um, and maybe the high touch method for, you know, their managers or their executives who may be kind of overseeing the implementation of the entire software. So it's, 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 it's common to kind of see both. So now that we kind of have like a, an understanding of, of like the, the theories behind onboarding, we can kind of jump into like the, the nitty gritty of some best practices. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, I'll go through like a, a, a framework that you can either start, um, you know, redo or like optimize your on, the onboarding process you have today. So first things first, um, you really need to understand what success looks like for your customers, right? I kind of alluded to that to before, um, and it's really about, you know, what is that big problem um, that you're trying to solve for them? And I think, I think it's, it's, it's important that um, you distinguish between, you know, what they want and not what you want, right? So in the examples here uh, on the right, um, you know, people don't sign up for Slack uh, to send direct or team messages, right? That's what you want them to do. On a higher level, what they're really looking for is like they want to simplify their communication with their team. And, you know, maybe they want to stop using so many different type of communications team uh, tools and kind of consolidate all that so it's easier to collaborate, right? Um, for people signing up to Twitter, um, they're not looking to tweet. What they really, really want, you know, deep down, whether or not they know it or not, is they want to connect with other people and ideas uh, in the world, right? Um, for Dropbox, you know, people want to be able to manage files um, from anywhere and, you know, not get bogged down by saving things locally and, and not having access to them when they're away from your computer. So <clears throat> when, uh, when you understand their goal, um, you, you, you now want to think about, you know, what is the appropriate sort of first instance uh, milestone or the aha moment that gives them kind of like a sneak peek of the value your company can deliver. Um, and this is kind of like the point where we can say someone has officially been onboarded. Um, and, you know, it's not always an easy thing to uncover. Uh, and it requires kind of quite a bit of experimentation uh, to kind of figure out what this kind of onboarded point looks like. So, you know, for Slack, um, they kind of figured out that it's, it was, you know, 2000 team messages sent. Okay. Um, so, you know, customers understood how their communications can be simplified when their team sent 2000 messages, right? Um, for, for Twitter, it's following a minimum of seven accounts. Um, you know, Facebook also had a very similar one. It was like seven friends within 10 days. So they, 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 they figured out this was kind of enough of, of, of kind of like a tipping point where like their newsfeed would be filled up with activity from their friends and they would be more compelled uh, to engage, right? And, and actually stick around. Um, you know, for, for, for Dropbox, it's adding one file to a folder and, you know, and adding it to one device that, that could be shared. So, you know, you know, these, these kind of quantitative goals um, basically represent a succession of behaviors or events that you want your customers to kind of exhibit. And I think, I think what you don't want to do is you don't want to label um, 
an onboarded customer for someone that's been, been in your platform for 30 days, right? That kind of definition is, doesn't really necessarily have a lot of correlation with the value that, that you're supposed to be delivering. And uh, personally to me, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to kind of follow, follow that, that, you know, that, that model for defining what an onboarding customer is. So I, uh, I, I see this all the time um, and uh, I see it a lot with, you know, particularly with a lot of like early stage founders um, and, and clients when we kind of first start. Uh, and sometimes I experience it with some of the apps that I use. And I think this is kind of when companies show you everything about them in, the, in that first interaction, right? They kind of go feature gun crazy on you and it's like, here's this, here's that. Oh, have you seen this? Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily have um, a regard, you know, for your first aha moment in, in helping you guide, guide, guide you to it, right? Um, I kind of call this the, uh, the dump and pray, right? We're going to throw you in, or dump you into the platform uh, and we're going to pray that you kind of, you figure it out all, all on your own, right? Um, I kind of take this akin to, you know, when you, you know, you, you, you run into someone on the street uh, and you ask them for directions and all of a sudden they're giving you the whole life story. Like, okay, you know, slow down. I just want to know where the, you know, the closest kind of cafe is. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very kind of similar feeling that, that your users would, would feel when, when they're kind of using your tool. Um, here's kind of an example of uh, a real estate CRM company. Um, um, that, that, that kind of employs that. Um, so, you know, they help real estate agents manage leads. And this was kind of the first email that I received uh, after signing up. So you can kind of take a look at that, you know, uh, that red box. And uh, you can see the, like the, the sheer laundry list of items that they want you to do. Um, so, you know, it's like set up your personal branding, um, configure your monthly e-newsletter, um, configure your birthday, you know, set up your automated lead capture, um, send us your contacts, right? While you're at it, uh, get started with your website, you know, start social media marketing, right? It, it, it literally has me kind of going and shriveling up like this, right? You know, like what, what, what should I do? Right. Um, and so, you know, as much as kind of founders and product teams are really excited to, to show off, <laughs> everything that their team has built, you kind of need to pace it. Um, and uh, you need to kind of focus on delivering, you know, one, you know, one milestone at a time to, to, to get them hooked. And uh, you certainly don't want to overwhelm them like my childhood hero here is, is looking like. I thought I, I thought I had some, some meme for, for the culture on this one. Um, okay. So I guess we can maybe take a break here and, and, and see if we have any kind of questions that popped up um, along the way. I don't see any questions yet, Dusan, in the chat window, but I, you know, I, since you gave us some examples, right, some of the big companies that we're familiar with, I, I would just love to know what, what's your favorite? What's the one you think does it the best? Um, I think, I think it, it, uh, for me, I just started, um, to pick up my French and, and, um, Duolingo does an exceptional job. Um, it, it's almost to the point where, you know, the, um, the onboarding process doesn't feel like you're on being onboarded. It's almost done like seamless and you're not even aware that's actually happening. Um, so that's kind of like an easy one that you can, you can take a look at, um, and, um, and, and see, you know, how seamless and how smooth they actually are able to execute that. It, I, it's funny, that jumped out to me because I've also been using Duolingo and it was so good that, you know, I upgraded to the paid <laughs> version because I thought it was just, you know, the free version was so good. I thought the paid version was perfect. Yeah. Um, the, the other um, question I kind of have for you is, you mentioned that it takes some experimentation, right, to kind of figure out and you have to do that experimentation. But even amongst the self-serve, hybrid, or high touch, you know, depending on what kind of a company you are and how maybe disruptive your solution is, I just wondered if you had any thoughts or quick comments about, you know, even if you're trying to figure out where in those three models you fall, any, any easy approaches to, 
to tackling that? Yeah, I think um, and I'm going to kind of touch upon this uh, in the rest of the presentation, but I think figuring that that aha moment really starts from like observing your power users, right? And um, you, you really want to kind of understand uh, and find some patterns between their usage on like what, what was a kind of a common behavior that they've all exhibited within your application to kind of find um, a commonality that all of them kind of done X done, like X completed, you know, or used X feature. And you, you know, you can, you can start that off with like some looking at your, you know, product analytics and then really following up with them with like, you know, interviews um, or in-person chats to really understand why they did those things. Um, so I think power users are probably your, your first, um, source to kind of figure out what that aha moment is. That's great. Thank you. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> sorry. And I have a quick question, Dushan, um, yeah. your previous example, um, about the real estate and this overload of information, um, is there a way to kind of slice this information and position in such a way that is kind of you can manage it or digest it better and then spread it in time like is there any technique that you would recommend maybe you, you'll talk about it but i'm just wondering because yeah yeah that's a great question i think i think what you you know i think what they what they did there is they kind of um they kind of they've kind of confused onboarding with like marketing and saying like here are all the things that you can do in our platform right and so mm -hmm. what i would recommend is you you would want to um, you know have a very kind of clear one task or milestone to kind of complete and have a very kind of clear call to action to encourage them to go do that one thing right um, and so you know given like the kind of like the breadth of the functionality you have for CRM like people use CRM or this tool for a variety of different reasons you could have for example you know you know get started. And then within the app, you can have, hey, tell us a little bit about you so we can kind of customize your onboarding experience. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that way you can kind of, you know, you split things up so you don't really hit them with the whole shebang like right up front, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll dive into this. So, okay, so, you know, how do we kind of design, um, um, you know, our onboarding process, right? What's, what's, what's a good way to start with that? So, you know, to the questions that were kind of being asked, you, what you really want to do is you want to identify that first milestone uh, that we talked about before. So, you know, for Slack, it's getting, you know, 2000 team messages. Um, for Eventbrite, it, it could be like getting your first event published, right? Um, for Haltech, it could be, you know, if you have a new, new, new startup that joins, it could be, you know, getting them to their first mentor meeting and getting value from, from, from that conversation, either be like, you know, improving their pitch deck or like refining their value prop or whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, Shan, to, to your question, you know, studying the power users is kind of like the, the, the great, the first kind of step to help identify what that milestone is. And then you experiment, you kind of run that hypothesis and you keep going until you find a, a, a sequence of events or behaviors that you, you are indicative that people are going to stick around and, and, and stay in your platform and, and, and that they were able to kind of find that moment um, as quickly as possible. And so, you know, from that, um, from that first milestone, you now want to kind of reverse engineer it. Okay. So, you know, think about all the steps um, that it takes for the customer to actually get there. You know, map that out in the list. Um, and this will now become your, you know, little micro, little funnel um, that your customers will go through uh, to get to that kind of first milestone. And so here's kind of an example um, with Shopify that I, that I hope kind of everyone can kind of get their hands around. Um, so, you know, for those who, who don't know, Shopify is, is an e-commerce platform um, that helps people launch their online businesses. Okay. So, you know, for, for, for Shopify, you know, let's say that their first milestone they've kind of figured out was, you know, launching your first, you know, your e-commerce store and, you know, you've been kind of perfecting, you know, some homemade lip balm. Um, and now you kind of want to launch your first lip balm online store. Right. And so, 
let's now work backwards to figure out what kind of steps the customer will take to kind of reach that reach that kind of aha moment. So, you know, the first thing obviously is, is, is obviously signing up, right? So you put your first name, your last name, your email, any other kind of subsequent info that they ask for. Um, you know, you might want to start setting up your billing, right? Let's figure out where the money will land, right? Um, uh, hook up with, you know, PayPal, you know, link, link, link um, with some payment processing tool to help facilitate, you know, visas and MasterCards and online interact and things like that. Um, then it's, you know, customizing your store, right? So, you know, <clears throat> picking out a great, great domain, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, designing your website, you know, maybe you want to put in some cool animations or like upload some hipster pics of people with cool outfits and that are like applying lip balm, you know, whatever it is to customize that experience. And then, you know, and then lastly, you want to kind of, you know, add products, you know, add, you know, add your different lip balms, write out some cool descriptions and boom, you can now like launch your store. So, you know, this is, these are like kind of the macro steps. And I think it's kind of good to start, start from there. And, you know, within every kind of macro level, <clears throat> there are like obviously a series of, of micro steps within each stage that the, that the, that the customer will kind of need to go through. So, you know, for example, with sign up, it's, you know, completing the sign up form and then, you know, activating, uh, activating their account. And then afterwards it's, you know, logging back in, um, and, and so forth. And so, you know, once you kind of outline all of those steps, um, you now need to be really mindful of all of the friction points, right? So, you know, what will stop my customer from going from point A to point B? And, um, you know, it could be, it could be a, a variety of friction points. Um, it could be, you know, you have a, a UI design problem, right? It's, it's, you know, the copy is kind of confusing. It's a little bit misleading, right? Uh, maybe there are too many steps, you know, so how many can you cut, can you cut? Um, how many can you postpone, right? Do they really need to see this right now? Uh, maybe there's some sensitive, um, you're asking them to complete some um, sensitive information about them that they're not just yet ready to do, right? It could be a whole host of things. And I think, I think you know, your job as a, as, a, as, a, as a growth marketer is to really find these friction points and um, help clear them, right? You really want to just clear them. And uh, I think this is probably the, 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 the more kind of challenging, but also the more kind of rewarding part of onboarding process because it requires a little bit of intuition, right? A little bit of instinct, um, some data, and um, a lot of experimentation. So, you know, let's take a look at example here. Um, MailChimp, right? So MailChimp is, is an email delivery tool, right? Their whole um, mantra is about sending better email, right? And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the first milestones for them, it could be, you know, sending your first email to your customers. Okay, that's what, that's what they, that's, that's what you would want to do signing up to MailChimp, right? But there are gonna be a lot of friction points that the customer will go through to do that. Uh, you know, one of them could be, you know, I'm not a designer, you know, I'm a marketer, right? Like I don't know how to put together like a visual stunning email. Um, and I may not have like a, a designer on staff, right? Um, another, another friction point would be, you know, how will my clients see this? You know, they want to know, like, how is the email going to look like um, in the inbox of their customers? And, you know, 10 times out of 10, this is going to be a showstopper. Like, I'm, I'm every single time I'm, you know, before I'm sending this, I'm testing to see what all these different things are about. Um, and, you know, lastly, they may not um, know, you know, what, what, what an appropriate subject line would be um, to open, to maximize open rates, right? Um, and the person who's using this could be like a junior marketer, right? They just come out of school um, and they're sending an email on behalf of the company for the first time. So, you know, they're very hesitant. They're very nervous, right? Um, you know, once you send it, you can't take it back. Um, so, you know, there's some real emotional and psychological factors in play here, right? And I think, I think it's important that you, that you uncover them because, you know, you're, you're, working, with, you're, you're, you're working with people on, on the other hand, right? And uh, you can kind of um, elicit that from them um, through 
customer interviews, uh, workshops, and things of the, things of like that nature. Um, so you know, sometimes you know these friction points are going to be beyond the scope of your product, right? Like you know, Mailchimp can't control what you put in the subject line, right? They can't control um, what what kind of content or how you wrote your email, but they're all about helping you send better email. So what they can do um, is they can help influence you. They can give you like some some stats or some helpful guides while you're drafting it to say, hey, out of our batch of emails that were sent, we found this style to work best um, for engagement, for example, right? And so, you know, so to clear these kind of friction points, right? You know, MailChimp did like a really, really um, bunch of cool things, in my opinion. Um, you know, for non-designers who can't who can't put together like a, a, a beautiful looking email, um, you know, they Mailchimp offers you like a whole bunch of templates, right? Like, hey, here are some beautiful ones you can kind of choose from. You can customize them. Um, all of them are already pre-developed for you, so you don't have to worry about coding anything. Um, you know, if you're worrying about what your customers will see, here's an option for you to send a test email, right? Um, you know, they partnered with, uh, with Litmus where you can kind of test your email in different type of email clients, right? You can see what it looks like on Outlook, on Gmail, um, you know, on iOS, uh, all these different, different formats. So depending on what your customers use, you can see how that email renders for them, right? Um, when you are, you know, writing a subject line, they might have like a little field validator that says, uh, uh, you know, your subject line is longer than nine words. We recommend that you shorten it down and, and you stay below that to maximize your open rate, right? So I think it's really kind of smart of how they've kind of connected, you know, the ways that they've clear friction points to the business problem they're trying to solve for the customer. Um, and, and, I, and I would always encourage people to kind of think, um, on these emotional barriers that people may have and try to clear them in, in creative ways as they, as they can. Um, when I was, um, when I was at DealTap, you know, one of the big issues we had was we had a lot of drop off, um, because we didn't really understand the, the economics of how realtors make money. And, you know, what I, what I realized was, you know, a decent real estate agent, um, makes, you know, or does about seven deals a year, right? So that's a that's that's a deal every other month. Okay, it's 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 not a lot on 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 a quantitative perspective, right? Um, but here we are trying to sell like a, a paperless contract tool to help them close deals, and you know they're signing up for a platform and they don't really have an active deal. You know they could be mid in between the months and they don't have an active deal to actually test or sorry, use our platform to see the aha moment. So they're signing up like, oh, I don't have time for this. I'm just gonna drop it off, right? And so, so what we did was we, we gave them an opportunity to um, add like test home buyers and test home sellers where they can kind of simulate the experience um, and see what the value of the product is, you know, before the deal, their actual deal comes, um, comes to fruition. And so they have a little bit more confidence and they're now ready to implement that, um, you know, when when it when it's time for their con for their clients to actually sign. So, um, it, you know, life life happens, right? And um, your uh, your customers can get distracted. It happens all the time, uh, and they can kind of drop off the the onboarding train. So, you know, it's kind of it's it's. it's Something like this is, is expected to happen. Um, but what's important is that you have some mechanisms to kind of nudge them and get them back on the, on the onboarding train. So you can send, you know, um, in-app notifications, you can send some emails, um, you can send, you can have like your account reps reach out to them. Um, but it's important that these outreaches and these communications have context in where they are in the milestone progress, okay? You want to you want to make sure that there's a connection between the usage of the product with the customer and what you're asking them to do in the communication. I've seen you know um, so many non-contextual onboarding emails. You know um, you know they send you like on day 15, try this feature, 
And I'm like, okay, well, I already use this. I already tried using that, right? Like, I, I, I don't need an uh, um, explanation on something that I've already done on the platform. So I think it's, it's kind of really important that, you know, your, your kind of retention-based emails have direct connection with the usage of the product um, and the progress that the customer has pertaining that particular milestone. And here's kind of an example of what, you know, Shopify did. Um, you know, they've, they recognized that they just started a new business and now they're encouraging them to continue off on the registration piece. Okay, so this is kind of the last section um, in the presentation that uh, I'm gonna wrap up with. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, you just, you just wanna be able to, you know, I'm gonna talk about like, being able to measure your, your, your customer progress um, so that you can see what's happening, what's working in, in, in the onboarding process. So, you know, if you, um, if you have an existing product um, and, you know, you have some sort of onboarding um, to optimize, my, uh, my, my key kind of recommendation is to always start with the biggest opportunity. And so, you know, you can utilize um, whatever analytics tools you have. It could be, you know, um, Google Analytics. It could be mixed panel, Amplitude. There's a, there's a whole bunch of, you know, product, in-app product analytics platforms. Um, and so you kind of want to, you kind of want to make it simple that you can actually act on uh, by plotting kind of these steps that we outlined in, in sequence. Um, this is something that I did for, for DealTap and, and it helped us kind of figure out where the biggest drop off is happening. And so you'll notice for us, um, you know, only, you know, only 49% of people activated their account, but um, it actually created a, created a document or created a contract, right? That means 51% of these people dropped off in this case, right? And so these 51% of people are like your gold mines. These are the people you want to learn, you know, you want to be intimate with, you want to, you want to be on, 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 you know, on speed dial with, you want to obsess to try to figure out, you know, what happened, right? Um, did they, did they churn because, you know, they weren't a good fit for your product, right? Um, or maybe they felt certain friction in the experience. Um, and so you really want to figure out what that friction really is. And I think knowing both either who's not your customer and what's wrong with your current product uh, is, is, is crucial either way. Um, so, you know, one thing to, to kind of, to kind of leave away uh, or close off here with is that, uh, you know, onboarding is not a, a set it and uh, forget it type of uh, type of work. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it should be really integral part of your product um, in your customer success roadmap uh, and something that you constantly need to iterate. So, you know, the, uh, the example here that I have is really an effective way to, to track the success of your onboarding, um, predict churn, but also really help validate product market fit. So if you guys can bear with me just reading, you know, understanding the, the, the chart here on the right. So the, the percentage points represent um, the percent of people who achieve value by a month of tenure. Okay. So for example, if we take, if we take the Facebook um, example of connecting with 10, 10 friends, um, we can see that in January, um, in January, only 3% of 24 customers connected with 10 friends. In, uh, in month two, it was 27%. Month three was 33%. So, you know, these aren't necessarily great stats uh, for someone like Facebook. So you can like, you can go ahead and make some updates and changes and say, for example, that happened during February, March, and now we're in April. So let's see how this change affected April people. Um, well, in month one, they had 5% experience value. Then in month two, we have 43% saw value. So this is kind of like a really big improvement. Uh, and it's kind of encouraging to kind of keep going. Um, you know, I, ideally you, you'd want to be, you want to be in November. Um, but, uh, you know, these figures, you know, don't take these figures by heart. Um, a lot of different businesses, the, the, the tenure, it changes, right? So, you know, it, it may not be a function of month, but it could be a function of days for like a social media app, like Pinterest, for example, or it could be a function of minutes or seconds. 
um, for like gaming apps, you know, mobile gaming apps. Um, but, you know, I really like this kind of breakdown because it's a very kind of clear way to see how you're trending um, with, you know, getting people to hook um, into your pro product and, and see value as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the summary of the onboarding framework. Um, you want to kind of define one to three, you know, success events. You want to work on those. Um, you know, focus on milestones with the biggest opportunity. And uh, you want to make it easy for your clients by eliminating all the possible hurdles and, you know, getting really, really detailed uh, to, the, to the minutia. Um, and, and, you know, keep measuring and, and keep optimizing. Um, and oftentimes what you'll find is, you know, when you change onboarding, it, ha it carries significant weight and changes to like your product roadmap, right? Um, like for example, in the MailChimp piece, um, if they found that, you know, people weren't sending emails because they, they weren't able to, to, to test, well, that just now, that, not, that just now introduced a new feature set with your product, right? And it changed the whole way that you onboard uh, or even talk about your, your, you know, your pitches when your sales reps are going to prospects. So um, those are kind of like my, my closing notes. Um, I hope, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed, enjoy this one. Um, if you have any, any questions, like, let me know. Um, and, uh, if you are still digesting, um, that's cool too. Uh, you can, uh, you can email me or just connect with me on LinkedIn and follow up there. That's great. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, Isabella, I'm just going to ask if you're, if you're monitoring the chat window, if anybody's posed any questions through that, mm. we've got uh, time for some questions now. Um, yes, actually, I do. Um, here's one question for you. How do we find out why customers are not being retained and what are some methods? Um, so I think, I think, you know, customer, the reason why uh, people don't, don't stick around with your, with your platform, um, um, I, think, I think those are the conversations that you need to kind of elicit from, from customers themselves. Um, you know, like when you have, um, when you have people unsubscribed for your email, you have a whole bunch of options that they kind of fill in, uh, to give you kind of some sort of indication of why they're not churning. Um, you know, you, you, you would, you would be able to, to, to see that in, in the analytics, but you really want to have, um, a handful of conversations from your churn customers to really understand what the reason for that could be. Um, it could be an onboarding thing. It could be that they weren't necessarily the right customer for you to begin with. Um, you know, maybe the pricing point was, was too high for them. Um, you know, I think, I think fundamentally the, the reasons for churn could be a, a whole variety, but I, I fundamentally, you, the best way to indicate that is through like qualitative conversations you have with your, with, with people that fall off. Jason, I, I think that's a, an interesting comment because as you were talking and I heard the question, I wondered about the aspect of um, are clients potentially falling off because they weren't your target clients in the first place? And maybe one of the things to do is go back and look at your marketing. How did they find you? There may yeah. be something in that original value proposition that, you know, it's either somehow getting to the wrong people. So by the time they get to you, it, you know, they're, they're not the right fit, but they don't yet know it because that value proposition isn't as clear as it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think that's where like attribution can be really, really helpful. Um, if you know, for example, you can also like, you can do cohort analysis of, of, you know, customers that were acquired through Facebook or through like blog. And if there's like a strong correlation with churn on a particular channel, you can, you can then optimize to see, okay, you know, Facebook is, we're getting a lot of, you know, non-committal people uh, or, or prospects coming from this channel. Uh, and you can run a few hypotheses of why that might be the case, right? Maybe, uh, you know, if you're part of like a certain Facebook group and you're, you know, you're posting um, messages to sign up, uh, but they're too early for you, you know, um, maybe like your, your platform is for, for, for more mature uh, business, for example, uh, you can get indications to that as well. Great, thank you. If, uh, if folks also want to come off of mute and ask questions, feel free to do that. That's certainly an option. 
And um, I, I just have also like one observation that um, I keep hearing over and over, especially right now during this time, that is a good time to connect with your customers and ask questions about their user experience, uh, do some surveys, do some brainstorming with your existing customers, and maybe reach out to those who um, decided to um, depart and ask uh, questions why and how and where and all those questions that um, will help you with uh, your further business development. And, um, and now because people are at home, it's more of a chance that they will respond. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, they could, they're just given the circumstances, you know, the, the feature set that you offer may not be as relevant for them right now, or like maybe, you know, the, the first two aren't as strong, but now, you know, they're relying on the third one a little bit more. Um, so that could feed your product team about making certain pivots. Um, maybe for example, you know, how they, how they intend on planning or using your product could dictate ways that you can package the product um, and the building where they can say, okay, if you don't need X amount for all of this, we can offer you a discount if you focus only on, on a certain functionality of, of the product. And that could be some creative ways you can um, still keep the customer engaged with offering value and one component of a product where while the other ones are kind of on the back burner until, you know, things clear up. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great suggestion. Well, Disney, I just want to say a big thank you to sharing that there's a lot of great information in there um, and I also appreciate that you put your contact information so if people are thinking about this and uh, they want to reach out to you this is the place to find you yeah yeah um, and you know it could it's totally totally informal and you know if, if, if someone has a unique kind of challenge with their with their business that you know may not be the you know, on the webinar to be the, the great forum uh, I'm happy to just you know give some free advice and, and, and give you you know discuss maybe different ways to think about it. That's wonderful. Well, thanks so much on behalf of Haltech and our partners. I uh, really appreciate you uh, doing this with us today and um, encourage anybody, if you're thinking about it, reach out to Dusan if you've got other questions you want to follow up on. Okay, awesome, yeah. Great. So at this point, we'll, um, we'll conclude the formal part of the presentation and um, it's, we'll stop the recording as well. I should mention that for everybody. Um, and at this stage, if anybody on